So, always wanted to know why the chicken crossed the road? Our guest probably won't be able to tell you, but by the time she's done speaking, you're going to want to share your home with a hen or a rooster. Hi everyone, and welcome to Calling All Vegans. I'm Sue Sparr, and this is my friend and co-host, Alec Bosse. Hi everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, our guest, aiming to help people reconsider their relationship with an animal which society has been programmed to see only as a commodity, has created a very special book filled with stunning photographs, the touching stories of previously exploited chickens, and the small but dedicated network of people who not only save them from horrible situations, but who share their homes with them. So please welcome Janet Holmes, photographer and author of Nest, to Calling All Vegans. Hi, Janet. Thanks. Hi there. Thanks so here. much for having me on the show. Uh, congratulations on your new job, I wanted to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Enjoying my week. One job and another. <laughs> Exciting times. Um, okay, let's put this to bed once and for all. Who came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, Sad, I think the chickens arrived, arrived first and then way too many eggs. It's true. Very, very, very good. good. An animal activist to the bitter end. <laughs> As a child growing up, were you a child that loved animals? I was. I, I definitely I was really curious about them. We had companions in our home. I was, you know, the kid who, you know, wrecked her first day of school dress crawling under the truck to talk to the garter snake. Um, and yet at the same time, I don't think I really thought a lot about the place of animals in our world. And, you know, we, you know, we bought pets, we rescued animals. It just wasn't something that in, from a social perspective that I thought about. And we certainly, they were on our plates, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, I also have had the great joy of sharing my home with a chicken. Uh, many years ago, I rescued six hens from a crack house, actually. Really? <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you that. No, I didn't realize uh, that was part of the story. When, uh, I don't always mention that part. But, uh, when only one remained, I moved her into the house. And uh, although each little lady had her own distinct personality, uh, Chick has shone through even more living under the same roof with her. Uh, she had a favorite chair, and she'd stare down anyone who sat in it. Uh, she loved to be held high above my head like a dinner plate, as if she was on a dinner plate. I mean, <laughs> the crazy things, the crazy things we do with our kids, right? Uh, and at bedtime, she would tuck her little head under her wing, and she actually snored like a, a cartoon character, a <laughs> cartoon chicken. Um, which story in the book touched you most? I think, you know, the story that really got to me was the one that I've written up, that I've included in an essay in the book um, from Maddie. And she wrote about a situation where she went on a rescue in, in wintertime in January um, in Colorado a couple of years ago. And she got the call. She said she was on a second date. She got this call. There's a rescue. There's a, a farm going bankrupt. The farmer, you know, can't, pay to take care of the chickens, can't pay even to have them slaughtered perhaps properly, and had invited activists onto the farm in order to rescue as many chickens as they could. And so I remember reading Maddie's story as she was posting about it on Facebook um, and thinking, I have to meet this person and I have to, to sort of see what's going on. And that was partway through the project that I've been working on um, in terms of taking these portraits, but I realized that was the one that really moved me the most. Yeah, and I'm sure there were some who would get left behind in a situation like that, possibly. Yeah, thousands, really. I mean, they, they succeeded in rescuing, I think, several hundred of the birds. Um, and, you know, they only rescued the ones that they could, you know, realistically find homes for, and they had to leave many of them behind. And that is, that is part of the story that is so heartbreaking, making, the, making those choices about which ones stay and which ones you, which ones you leave on the floor. Yeah, and no matter how much good you've done in that situation, you, it's, it's almost impossible not to focus on the ones who you had to leave behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would haunt me the rest of my life. But it's not just hens, but it's roosters who get treated horribly. 
Um, some of them wind up in cockfighting rings, uh, while still others are born onto uh, egg farms, and they are either ground up in macerators or suffocated in bags uh, because they're considered useless, basically. Why do you feel there's so much disregard where they're concerned? I mean, I think one of the sort of the, the bigger issues is really how we classify um, creatures, um, non-human and human, based on some kind of very narrow concept of, of function and, you know, assign values to them. I mean, we have a society, a human society, where we have um, people sort of, sort of divided in a binary category between male and female and with a great deal of focus on reproductive function and and that sort of thing. And then, you know, you sort of go into the animal world and you see similar patterns. And as I said, this idea where you commodify an animal and conclude that the only value that that animal has is potentially, as I said, as sort of an egg laying hen. And you have the sort of the, the, the males, you know, viewed as garbage, I think is part of this whole structure where we see things in a binary, in a binary way and value one and devalue, devalue the other. And when I started this project initially, I initially because of the encounter that I had with a hen at the Wild Bird Fund who was suffering from severe reproductive illness, and and then my encounters virtual with um, people who were rescuing them, and they were primarily people um, with wombs, um, and so I started the project by thinking about in a very binary way. I thought about women and hens. And very quickly, I got schooled by the people I was dealing with um, to first of all to think about um, to think about the males, to think about the roosters, and to think about these you know these animals who were sort of treated as as garbage. And so the the project broadened you know to sort of include roosters as well as hens. And then as an, a further level, it was further broadened again to also start thinking more broadly of humans in in, you know, outside that binary system that just because even though most of the, the humans I photographed are people, um, you know, who have wombs, not all of them do, not all, and some of the ones who have wombs don't necessarily see themselves, you know, in the categories of female um, or women. And so I think this has really been, continues to be a learning process for me in terms of thinking very carefully about terminology and categorization and trying to sort of get away from those categories and really just see beings um, and, uh, and, and sort of valuing them as individuals. Absolutely. For sure. So the title of your book is Nest. Can you just tell us a little bit um, why you chose that for the title and uh, what's the story behind that? Sure. Well, there's, there's sort of two parts to it. Um, one of them was when I, the working title of this project, when I, when I first started it in 2017, was, was based on something that somebody, um, a very well-known sort of photo editor had said to me in a class in some work that I was doing. And she said, why would anyone rescue a chicken? And so my working title for the project was that for a number of years, why would anyone rescue a chicken? And I actually made a little keepsake book from the first year of the project that I had sort of shared with rescuers and people featured in the book and sort of sold as a fundraiser. And it was called, why would anyone rescue a chicken? Mm -hmm. When I sort of moved into the phase of looking for a major publishing house to publish the book. Um, and I connected with this amazing publisher, Kier Verlag um, based in Germany to produce the book and, and fell in love with their work. We spoke about what we would do about a title. And because I had this little starter book called Why Would Anyone Rescue a Chicken? I couldn't use the same title. So we, <laughs> we went off and searched for another title. You're being and, a magician with yourself. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, we sort of thought about a couple of names and my next working title was Home to Roost um, because it's very much about the concept. This is, a, this is a book about chickens living in houses. And I thought, well, that's a cute name. And they said, sorry, that doesn't work. <laughs> We need the title, they said, to be something that makes sense in German as well as English, even though your book will be in English. And they said, well, in Germany, we don't really have that word rooster to mean the male of the species and to also have that concept of, you know, roosting and going to bed. Mm -hmm. So that caused me, because I, I love words, to sort of go off and research the meaning of the word chicken and the meaning of the word rooster and hen. And I discovered this fascinating thing, which was that in a lot of languages, um, the, the male of the species in chickens is actually 
you know, from English, it's the word cockerel, shortened to cock, and similar words in <clears throat> French, for example, cock, C-O-Q, et cetera, et cetera. Well, apparently when the pilgrims came to the New World, they were really uncomfortable with that word cock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, I that word that. became associated with the male member because of the of the sort of strutting behavior of cockerels. However, the pilgrims just could not bring themselves to use that word because they were embarrassed, and so they came up um, with sort of a you know with a different with a different word. Um, and we, they ended up with rooster, which also is associated with the action of roosting in a house at bedtime. So, as I said, but that that kind of that word alignment didn't work in German. So we went off looking for a, another word, um, having rejected the word roost and came up with nest. And the word nest works in German and in English. Um, and nest also has that cozy Mm -hmm. uh, sort of meaning and I think really that is very much kind of about the concept of this book and that that idea of nest and home and I think the sense of sanctuary um, and refuge that is associated with that word and that is very much what this book is about I think it's both it's photographs of nests um, that include humans in them um, and I also hope that it kind of creates a kind of a psychological space that feels like a nest, that feels like a sanctuary and a refuge for the people who are looking at the book. I love it. I love its simplicity. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that uh, explanation. Every day is a school day. Huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. So when you're preparing to uh, do a photo shoot, how do you help uh, your subjects uh, become a bit more comfortable before they get uh, their photo photographs taken? Well, I think, you know, we've got two kinds of subjects in these, in these, in this project. We've got human subjects and we've got non-human subjects. And actually, frequently the human subjects need more help than the non-human <laughs> um, But starting with the non-human subjects, I think one of the, it's very important really to spend some time with them, if at all possible, if I, especially if I'm getting close to them. And so I try to be on their level. Um, I sit down on the ground, for example, and let them come over and check me out. Um, I try to take my cues from their caregiver who knows something about their behavior. And I'll ask about what they like and what they don't like. Some, some chickens like to be touched in a particular way. Some don't like to be touched at all. You learn how to hold them and do those kinds of things. And you watch for signals in terms of their behavior as the photo session goes on to make sure that they're still comfortable with the process. And I think, you know, one of the things as well, when you think about photographing non-humans is, you know, there's the issue of objectification, you know, and the, and, you know, this was, this was a subject, you know, when it came to men photographing women, you know, um, mm -hmm. in previous decades and that sense that you're really, you're, that there's no kind of opportunity for the subject to participate in the, in the photo session and no, and no sense of consent um, and no bilaterality, like no sense of that, that, that being a shared experience. And so for me, you know, a non-human can't really consent in an active way, but I can make the experience of a photo session something where they are experiencing me as well as me experiencing them and even if they don't have a camera in hand um you know they are they are still it's a shared it's a shared experience i think that's the goal well and i did read that you um if you feel like they're uncomfortable you'll you will stop the session yes yeah and it's um it's 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 tricky you know you have those moments when you just think oh i just five more minutes, just yeah. five more minutes, you're almost in the right position. And, and it's very understandable why we sometimes, you know, push that boundary a little bit. And, and so, you know, it's critical to sort of be able to stop yourself and, and take a pause, maybe photograph somebody else, photograph them in a different way. Um, you know, use a zoom lens, for example, so that you're not so close to them, different kinds of things. And then same thing with humans. And as I said, photographing humans also has its own challenges because they usually want direction. <laughs> I'm mostly used to photographing the non-humans and the non-humans are just doing their thing and the humans are like, should I pose? <laughs> Something with my hair. <laughs> They're way too complicated and vain, yes. right? Well, yeah. there was a cute picture of you and your other uh, little add-on piece, which we'll speak about later, yeah. um, where you, you're lying on the floor taking a picture of something and you've got a chicken standing on your back. So I'm assuming that that 
Cal was quite comfortable with you. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, but I yell, I wasn't sure. <laughs> but that's Bree Rooster. Um, and Bree, oh. Bree Rooster is an amazing fellow, um, actually rescued um, at the Wild Bird Fund where I used to volunteer. Um, he was found on a, on a city street and he grew up, um, uh, live, lives with his human Camille, um, who moved out of Brooklyn because she wasn't allowed to keep a rooster. So she moved back home to Ohio where she could keep, keep Brie with her. And we were doing a photo shoot for, um, a Christmas card. Um, and so I was at Catskill Animal Sanctuary in, in New York state, and I was lying on the, on the deck um, way down on the ground in order to be able to photograph Brie at ground level. And um, he was supposed to be investigating a Christmas tree, um, which was down at the ground level. Um, and he did, you know, he did look at it, um, but he kept sort of looking at the Christmas tree and then he would trot over and jump up on my shoulder, um, <laughs> work himself on my back to look through the viewfinder of my camera. So, um, so as I said, that was um, certainly, certainly a fun experience. What a cutie. <laughs> now, um, the after rescue photos are truly remarkable and what must be their contrast to what life would have been like before for these uh, chickens. Um, would have been filled with darkness, disease, misery, hopelessness. But the photos in the book are full of warmth and light and contentment and a sense of freedom. Was this a strategy on your part? I think it was um, partly, it was a coping strategy for myself to some extent in terms of the way that I photograph. And then it also has become, you know, sort of part of the design of the book. Um, there are a number of photo photographers, um, Joanne MacArthur is one of them, for example, based in Toronto, who do an extraordinary job photographing animals in places of exploitation. And to be perfectly honest, I am not comfortable doing that. Mm. Um, I, it just, it just, I just can't. And so I've chosen in my photography practice to focus on rescued animals almost exclusively and photograph them in rescue settings, um, whether it's a setting where they're being treated or a setting where they're living in a sanctuary. And so that has been the approach I've taken. And I think philosophically, it's really helpful for people to see those images um, because it allows them to, I think they can be a, an easier image for some people to relate to yeah. and it, it draws people in. Um, and so I think it's really important to have both kinds of images out there. Um, but my images I think are sort of a, an entry point for people, um, relatable and um, making it possible for them to start having that inner dialogue about their relationship to animals and whether they exploit animals and what they might do about it. When it came to this particular project, I really did want to photograph uh, the chickens in a home-like setting um, because I wanted people to think about the, the, you know, why we think this is surprising when we have animals chickens in particular in our homes all the time. And so photographing them the way that I would photograph where some people might photograph a dog or a cat really, but, but doing it in a sort of a, a joyous, peaceful way, I think again, allows people to sort of, to think about that, think about that process and ask themselves those questions. Well, you did their story justice though as well, because you show them in this, you know, very homey setting that are safe, but then for some of them, you've accompanied uh, where they came from. Like you've told the story of where they came from. So people do get to know the reality of it, where, you know, from where they came. But uh, they see where they can end up, which mm -hmm. is nice. It's good for them. What I decided to do, because as I said, a lot of the images in the book, I mean, are I mean, as I said, they're, they're peaceful and happy. And I mean, some of them are silly and they really make you laugh. Um, and so... I wanted to show, you know, the, the breadth of the, the chicken's experience, but by accompanying the, those photos with about five little mini memoirs that are written by the rescuers themselves about different aspects of the rescue experience, whether it is grieving, you know, the loss of a companion dealing with an act of rescue, like Maddie's story, um, or um, other elements uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of life that, as I said, allows people to see the other side. Um, and at the same time, sort of having those two components, really it's, I think there's also 
potentially a risk that when you only see an animal who is suffering, you reduce that, that animal to suffering. And there's so much more to them than their past experience. So you have met many, many chickens in your life at this point, and they all have, they oftentimes have creative names. Did you have a favorite name uh, that, that kind of stuck out to you? Oh, I mean, there are so many, but I, I think Leonard Crowen <laughs> is right up there. He's featured in the book. He's one of the last chickens I met for this project. Um, he was rescued by Julia, a member of a group called the Chicago Roo Crew, which is a women-led group of people um, rescuing chickens in the, in the Chicago area. Um, and Leonard Crowen is crowing in the book, uh, uh, one of my favorite photos. So uh, as I said, he's quite, I think that's sort of one of my favorite names. That's cute. Um, so there are two Canadian families featured in Nest. Uh, but before telling us about them, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to my friend Leanne Austin, who runs uh, Milo's Missions Micro Sanctuary and just so happens to take in chickens. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted you to talk to us about the, the two Canadian families. Oh, sure. Okay. So, um, one of the sanctuaries featured in the book is Brown, the Browns Micro Sanctuary. Um, Tamara, um, and so you'll see a portrait of uh, you'll see a portrait of uh, Rue June Brown um, in the book, um, as well as another as well as another portrait um, uh, of a couple of a chicken and a dog, um, and then the other one is Contented Clucks Micro Sanctuary, um, um, and that's operated by Lynn, based in the Ottawa region. Wow. So. When you're not working as a lawyer, you also uh, volunteer as a photographer for animal rescue groups. Uh, so you not only donate your time, but you co uh, contribute financially as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. What I try to do, and I, I have to admit that, you know, that things have been a little bit on pause in the pandemic. It's been hard to sort of do this kind of work. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to a change um, as we all are. And, and not just because it means I'll be able to get a haircut again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hear this. I missed, I missed the haircut window again. I cannot believe I did this. I got in there. I got in there just on uh, Friday. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so what I try to do is I try to work with um, sort of shelters, sanctuaries, rescue groups, individuals, um, both kind of in places where I live, um, but also when I travel, I often try to sort of look up a place and do photo sessions, photo sessions when it's possible. And I'll create images for them that they can use on social media. Um, if there's any images that are print worthy that could sort of be uh, sort of something that they could sell um, I will sort of make some prints for them um, for that purpose. And, and then often, as I said, you know, to the extent I'm able, I, I may make sort of financial donations as well, or when I'm selling other products, so selling books, selling greeting cards, selling prints, I always uh, donate at least 50% of my profits to different rescue groups. Um, more recently, I've created an ebook, which was part of the Kickstarter campaign that I ran for mm -hmm. Nest. Um, but I also made an ebook that's an instructional ebook on how to take better portraits of uh, the non-humans in our life. And that, with that ebook, 100% um, of the proceeds will go directly to rescue organizations. And I'm also going to take the opportunity, depending on sort of sort of when I'm when I'm aware of it, to help people with their fundraisers, for example. So I'm doing one right now um, with the Browns Micro Sanctuary, which is raising some money until the end of the month um, um, for their veterinary costs. And so people who make a donation um, of fifteen dollars or more to their um, to their fundraiser, get a copy of the ebook, which is normally priced at twenty five dollars. Oh, that's great! That. And then if they get the book, they get to see that picture of you uh, with Bree standing mm -hmm. on your back. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the uh, the web address if people wanted to make that donation to get a copy of the ebook? Um, to get a copy of my ebook, um, they can contact me at janethomesphoto at gmail .com, and my website is janethomesphoto.com. Um, if they wanted to make the donation to the Browns Micro Sanctuary, I can send them the link to the to the to the to the funding page for that. 
When going to JanetHolmesPhoto.com, you'll also be able to find information about Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So make sure to check it out there. Before we part ways, I just wanted to say you had written something truly lovely uh, on your website. I see this project as more than a beautiful book. It's a platform to help people see what I have seen, that in the ways that truly matter, chickens are people just like us. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, here's the book once more, okay. Nest. Um, so we really appreciate you sitting down with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this project. It's been really meaningful for me and I'm really excited to share the images and the story with everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.